Hey, I'm Thomas Serbuk and the head of science at NASA. I cannot tell you how excited I am to be here today with you to talk about one of the more exciting and challenging scientific missions for NASA. The first steps of the Mars 2020 campaign were accomplished with the landing of our Perseverance rover on the surface of Mars. Then our rover began collecting samples from the surface of Mars. This effort will continue over the next few years as we take advantage of Perseverance's ability to capture and contain up to 40 samples. This effort is laying the groundworks for one of our most ambitious campaigns yet, the Mars Sample Return. An international collaboration with the European Space Agency, this proposed mission is being designed to transport up to 30 of those valuable samples from the Red Planet back to Earth for future analysis. By returning Martian samples to Earth, we can apply the full breadth of terrestrial science laboratories capabilities and research. We also believe this to be the next logical step in our quest to eventually land humans on the surface of Mars. Moreover, these samples collected by Perseverance during its exploration of an ancient river delta are thought to be the best opportunity to reveal the early evolution of Mars including the potential for life. There's so much to focus on for something this complex. One key area is, of course, safety. A major focus of this effort is the safety of our home planet. Planet protection is the discipline of protecting solar system bodies, such as planets and moons from possible contamination by Earth life, while protecting Earth's biosphere from any potential adverse effects that could result from being material collected from these bodies back to our planet. The NASA ESA team is working closely with each agency's planetary protection leadership to ensure that every spacecraft sent to the Red Planet has been cleaned to prevent Earth organisms from compromising scientific investigations and to implement numerous steps designed to protect Earth and provide safety assurance by preventing any uncontained or unsterilized Mars material from being delivered to Earth. NASA takes these efforts seriously, and we have put work into assessing the risk. The question of whether samples from Mars could pres present a hazard to our biosphere has been studied by several different panels of scientific experts from the United States and elsewhere over the past several decades. Reports from these panels have found an extremely low likelihood that samples collected from areas on Mars, like those being explored by Perseverance, could possibly contain a biological hazard to our biosphere. With that, I just want to tell you how excited I am to be part of this history-making mission, truly international breakthrough mission, addressing one of the most exciting questions that has been boggling human minds for millennia, and that is, is there life elsewhere? This mission will give us a partial answer to that relative to Mars. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance, and I'm here with Dr. Daniel Barth. It's the 54th episode, and you're going to talk about the sample return from Mars yes. and um, yes, sample return and, and the Mariner's Valley. <clears throat> Some of the awesome. uh, astounding research that's being done with various <laughs> cameras in orbit around Mars. They're not even touched down yet, but. Uh, I just had to give a big smile when I saw your video. I'm sure that's from NASA's Science Visualization Studio. Yeah. Uh, about the sample return to Fetch Rover. And there was an announcement just this week that the Fetch Rover has been scrapped. Oh. The Fetch Rover has been scrapped in the favor Fetch of scrap. wow. ingenuity style helicopters on Mars. 
So they're now okay. talking about uh, an ingenuity style helicopter with some ability either to move short distances on wheels or possibly mm -hmm. to have hopping technology. You've seen like the Boston Dynamic uh, dogs where they, they seem to hop. And yeah. uh, this hopping technology could get us where we need to go on Mars. And they think that the Ingenuity rover or the Ingenuity helicopter has been so successful that they think it's it's more maneuverable, it's uh, more powerful in terms of getting into different places, and it's it's to me it's just wow this is amazing. This is an example of science. I'm really pleased about this. Even a big organization like NASA, relatively speaking, pivoting on a dime because they're yeah. taking a look at new data uh, from... Daniel, I don't think I've ever seen NASA do this before. I, I mean, haven't either. Once they're like locked in on something. Oh, they're like they're like one of these big uh, container ships that take two yeah. miles to slow down and stop. Uh, oh, bring all engines to a stop? Sure, we'll come to a stop a couple hours from now and 100 miles down the road. This NASA is such a monster organization and... They've, they've seen the ingenuity results and everybody has gone, wow, this is amazing. This reminds me of some, uh, what it reminded me of immediately was Edward Jenner and the smallpox vaccine. And when he mm -hmm. tested it and he was getting positive results, he basically said, to heck with it, give everybody the vaccine. I'm that sure this is the new way forward. And uh, that went forward. Uh, and Science sometimes does this. Science sometimes does this. And we need to be aware of our science history. Uh, I was fortunate enough this weekend, I stumbled on a public service announcement from 1943, okay? 1943, and they were talking about the Salk vaccine for polio. And they said, you need Mr. and Mrs. America, you need to be aware. The SOC vaccine, the very famous polio killing vaccine, is 75% effective. How many times have we seen on social media, oh, well, if it's not 100% effective, it's, it's not a real vaccine. Yes, it is. And then they went on to talk about, oh, and you need not one, not two, but three inoculations to make the polio vaccine completely effective. And they said, there's lots of people who got the first inoculation and then stopped. I'm just yeah. thinking, I'm having deja vu all over the place. <laughs> right. Because we hear this same sort of thing in social media today. And we have to realize, science is not about guarantees. Science is not perfect. Science doesn't deliver 100% effective. Uh, that would put all the lawyers out of work, wouldn't it? If something yes. were 100% effective. Um, but this is, this is kind of interesting. This is NASA saying, we have real data that can fundamentally change and make our lives better, easier, and our mission more powerful. And they're, how long do you think they've worked on the fetch rover, Scott? Uh, a long time. Saying, I'll bet you it's been over a decade. I was going to say, at least over a decade. And they're like, okay, throw that in the bin. This new yeah, thing is chunk, that okay. much better. Now, what it also tells me is maybe they built in enough margin into the the helicopter to say, well, maybe we'll use this too, or maybe instead we'll use that, you know? So, and because to start from zero, okay, with all the in-flight character characterizations they have to do to get everything space flight ready to everything, you know, and this thing everything. has to be, um, can't in any way infect the, uh, the samples, right? So yeah. this was something they went crazy over, you know, in designing yeah, they're uh, now the original talking capture about stuff. So a an, a helicopter with some kind of on the ground mobility. Yeah. And some kind of a robotic arm to reach out and grab samples. And right. then a, a storage container. Uh and I don't know if they're going to be working with a rover. I'll, I'll be fascinated to see how this develops. And this is going to be kind of moonshot thing where Kennedy said, we will go to the moon 
and back within this decade. They're really setting that kind of timetable for themselves, which I'm thrilled and stunned at the same time. So go NASA. Uh, right. And uh, anyway, we put a link for the article uh, about this from space.com and it's in the uh, it's in the show notes, so folks should download that. Yep. Uh, the other kind of Mars news we came across this week, and we talked about this just a while ago. Gee, are there new and different minerals on Mars? We talked about this at the Global Star Party. And we said, ah, I asked the question. I said, do you think there are new minerals on Mars that we haven't discovered? Well, uh, there's a unique form of quartz that they found on Mars called tritomite. And tritomite, T-R-I-D-Y-M-I-T-E. Okay. It almost sounds like tridynamite. <laughs> but tritomite, and I was also reminded of trinitite, which is the volcanic, or rather the, uh, the glass, the radioactive glass from the Trinity site where the atomic blast happened. But we're talking about, okay, there's this rare kind of quartz and it takes water, steam, pressure, temperatures over 1800 Celsius. The only way it's produced on earth is when we've had an explosive volcanic eruption, something like Krakatoa, Mount St. Helens, really big explosion, very violent, very high temperature. And they found this tritomite in a layer of volcanic ash and material in Gale Crater, and they've traced this back. They think they've, they're doing some work with the spectral analysis of the ash and everything else, and they've traced it back to a Tharsis region volcanic eruption about 1.5 billion years ago. Hmm. When Mars would have had enough internal heat, enough volcanic pressure and activity to make this tremendously powerful uh, Krakatoa and more size eruption forming this unique sort of quartz. And this really, Mars is a unique environment. Doesn't have an oxidizing atmosphere. It's all CO2, it's low pressure, but in its time, it's had really powerful volcanic events. We see that from the Tharsis bulge and the, uh, the volcanic flows in the western edge of the Mariner's Valley. And we see it in the shield volcano uh, types, the four major Tharsis volcanoes, which include Olympus, of course. And these are all shield volcanoes. Uh, Olympus Mons is the size of Germany, uh, bigger than the state of Arizona. And right. uh, the slope, Scott, the slope is five degrees or less almost everywhere up to the caldera. So you realize, oh, I, I could take a, a Polaris four-wheeler. I could, I could run yeah. up the slope of, of uh, Olympus. You could hike up it with no problem. A five degree slope is what we put on a driveway to make right. sure that the rain drains off into the gutter. Uh, it's, 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 uh, but that means the, the volcanic material had to be very fluid. Could not have been very viscous. It had to be able to flow. Imagine an eruption that flows across an area start in the center of germany and it flows it's still flowing when it hits belgium and france it's kind of oh, crazy okay uh it's, it's really it's really quite amazing so i'm looking forward to new stuff and more things on mars and uh before we uh we go on i want to yes i want to mention star mentor again we're starting to get some reviews on amazon yay, yay. so what are, are they saying that? And uh, I'm hoping that uh, the folks in the audience who've ordered their copies, I'm hoping to hear in chat that you've got yours. And I really hope you'll post a review for us because that's so important to our success. So um, that's really thrilling. And the reviews coming in are very positive so far. And uh, Mike Wiesner put on a very nice uh, review, both on Amazon and on his website. And he was, he was so kind and he said, boy, I wish I'd had this book when I was starting out. Uh, I'm paraphrasing you, Mike, but gosh, that's that's very flattering, and and thank you very much. So, 
let's go ahead and talk about exploring the Mariner's Valley. And okay, this is my I'm a picky scientist uh, section. Uh, I got to tell you, folks, the Mariner's Valley isn't a canyon. We talk about, oh, the Grand Canyon of Mars. I know, I know, I'm a picky scientist, but as a scientist, as an astronomer, uh, as a physicist, when I use language about things scientific, my language, I try to make it as precise and as accurate as I can, because unlike a lot of areas of our society today where we play around with words and say it doesn't mean that, no, it means this, science doesn't do that. In order for science to function, when we say things like river, canyon, caldera, shocks, quartz, when we say things like this, we mean it to be something very, very specific. When a physicist talks about heat, it's about energy, not about your heating and cooling system. We have very precise meanings. And when I see stuff in the science press, the Martian Grand Canyon, I just, I despair a little bit because friends, it's not a canyon. A canyon, according to Merriam-Webster and some other geology checks, basically a narrow chasm or valley. Uh, hmm, Mariner's Valley, 125 kilometers wide, so narrow, oh no. <laughs> all relative, I guess, but it's a narrow Casmer Valley with steep cliff walls. Yes, the Mariner's Valley has that certainly in many places. That has been cut into a planetary surface by running water. No, the Mariner's Valley is not a canyon in that sense. Did it have water in it? It does have water in it. And you would imagine being something that big and that deep and that low, of course it's going to collect water. Any water movement on the surface is going to go downhill that falls into that canyon is never coming out again, especially in Mars, very cold temperatures. So you're like, yeah, okay, sure. Did it collect water? Yes. Did water maybe help erode the side some? Yeah, probably so. But was it cut by running water like the Grand Canyon in Arizona? No, it was not. Um, we do know and again, when I say no here, let me refer to the scientific no. We have strong evidence supporting and a strong uh, confidence in this that Marinus Valley has been significantly shaped by running water, particularly the edges. When you talk about a steep, narrow canyon and you have, you have this flat area and then you have this steep cliff, yes, when water runs over the surface, and runs down into the interior. Yes, it erodes the walls. It causes avalanches and slips in the cliff walls. Yes, of course it does. Uh, but that's a long way from having the canyon carved by water. The reason we know, we're, we're like really sure that the Mariner's Valley, and I can hear people now, oh, how do you know that, that uh, three billion years ago, that water didn't carve this canyon. Well, one of the reasons we know is if you're going to have a water carved canyon, it's going to run in the direction in which water flows. This makes sense. Water is flowing from north to south and you're going to get a canyon. You're not gonna get a canyon east west. How does water flow that way? Well, if we look at the geography of Mars and we know that we have Northern lowlands and Southern highlands. And the northern hemisphere of Mars averages 10 kilometers lower. That's how high planes fly. That's your jet plane from New York to Los Angeles flies 10 kilometers or a little more high. And we're like, oh my gosh. So they have this 10 kilometer difference. People have asked for decades how this can be so. There's many theories about why the southern highlands are so much higher than the Northern Plains. But irregardless, if you think about the Northern Hemisphere as being lowlands, the South as being highlands, gee, which way is water gonna flow, Scott? Especially around the equator where the transition point occurs, it's gonna mm -hmm. go from South to North. Mm -hmm. It's going to flow in this direction. 
Yeah, it's and, higher going to a lower. And correct, stuff. correct, exactly. I mean, and that's what gravity will do to it. So that's right. And we know that we know that rivers meander. We know that. Take a look at the yes. Amazon or the Mississippi or the Nile from space, sure. and you see that they meander. But the general flow is in one direction. And guess what? The Mariners Valley runs east-west, almost uh, right along Mars Equator. It does not, in fact, hmm. have anything like a north-south direction. So what and, created this giant gash in, in the- Right, the giant gash, and it's pretty much perpendicular to the way water would flow on the surface in any kind of a natural hydrosphere. So we look at the Mariner's Valley, and we know that hmm, not a canyon. So if it's not a canyon, what is it? And there have been there have been a lot of theories and hypotheses, but let's let's take a step back and say let's I'm going to take you through what I think is the best theory to date on how the Mariner's Valley forms. And I got to put a little asterisk here. After this, we haven't we haven't had boots on the ground there. We haven't had a rover there. Uh, nothing. That's that's. Uh, We've explored it with cameras from orbit. But that's about it. So we think of Mars, half the Earth's diameter, half of the Earth's diameter and one-tenth the mass. That one-tenth mass is what gives Mars its difficulty holding on to atmosphere and liquid water. The one-tenth mass makes for a one-third Earth's gravity, approximately and makes it much easier for Mars to lose atmosphere and smaller things cool off more quickly. Hmm. This is why Mars core cooled and is mostly solidified today. Uh, we don't say absolutely positively because we believe there has been volcanic activity on Mars within the last couple of million years. And that says there's still active pockets of uh, internal geology on Mars, where we have uh, pockets of magma that are still under the surface and haven't cooled off yet. But small things cool more quickly. And Mars lost most of its internal heat in about the first 1 billion years. So Mars, like Earth, about 4.5 billion years old. Uh, so far as we know, 4.5 to 5 billion years, give or take. And over that first billion years, as it's cooling off, volcanic activity slows down. Now on Earth, because we're twice the diameter, 10 times the mass, there hasn't been time enough for all of the heat energy to leak out of the interior and let the core solidify. The moon, on the other hand, half the size of Mars, and it's long been solidified no volcanic, significant volcanic activity. Uh, the moon probably stopped having volcanic activity in the first one half to three quarter billion years after it was formed. So when Mars loses its internal heat and the volcanic activity slows, things start cooling and we know, uh, except for water, which is notorious, and some metal alloys, when things cool, they tend to shrink, they contract. And we've many of us have done this experiment. Scott, do you ever do the experiment with the brass ring and the brass ball on a stick? You heat up the ring and you can pass the brass you, ball. No, but I've, I've seen it done. Seen yeah. it done. Yeah, many people have done it or seen it done. And this is just an example of things expanding when they're hot, contracting when they're cold. And as the crust cools, the crust cools first. Obviously, the crust cools before the deep interior. So the deep interior is cooling more slowly, changing shape and size. So as the crust cools, it shrinks. And as it shrinks, we get grabbins. And we see grabbins on Earth. The most common grabbin on Earth is the one that's one of the most famous is Death Valley, California. Hmm. 200 and 60 something feet or 100 meters below sea level, give or take. And why did that happen? Because 
blocks, tectonic blocks were spreading and the block in the middle no longer supported uh, sank into the interior. And so what we get with the Marinus Valley is a giant tectonic fault. I don't know if you want to call something this big a graben or not. And of course, if we're going to confirm it's a graben, we need boots on the ground. Uh, rovers, as majestically awesome as they are, don't really have the mobility or the uh, capacity to carry that kind of science to do what a geologist does to go and sample and look for faults and lay down, uh, you know, they have seismic probes where they set off explosives and watch the shock waves echo down through so they can locate faults. Uh, rovers can't do this yet. And people could do it today if they were there, but it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. It looks like a giant graben, giant tectonic fault where the crust of Mars is pulled apart as it contracts and the tectonic blocks in oh, between wow. have just fallen in and sunken. Hmm. So we take a look at that and we have a diagram. Uh, we have a diagram for a graben, and I'm not sure if Paul is working and he has that, or maybe I should share a screen. You should try sharing your screen. Got it, doing that right now. There we go. So we've um, got this graben and uh, this diagram, uh, I think came from NASA or the US Geological, uh, USGS. But basically it shows here how you get a normal fault as things split and then the tectonic block in the middle shrinks. And on Mars, much more significant than what we've seen anywhere on Earth. And we see this, this is an iconic picture. And I'm, this is a NASA photo, but I'm sorry, I'm not sure what mission this was. Uh, this might've been a Viking photo, but uh, we see this, the Mariner's Valley over here on the left, this is the Tharsis Bulge. And you can see a couple of the major volcanoes there. And the fracture starts here. And then the canyon really opens up here. And we see, oh, there's additional fracturing through here. And it runs all the way across this picture. It's nuts. Seven kilometers deep, 7,000 meters deep at its deepest point. That's equivalent to the Marianas Trench or thereabouts, uh, and 125 kilometers wide in along much of its length. That means because of Mars' shorter horizon, because it's a smaller diameter planet, you cannot stand on one edge of the Mariner's Valley and look across and see the other edge. If you were there, it would just look like you were standing on top of some massive cliff structure looking down into a plateau. But it's not. It's actually a graben. There is another size. It's just you can't see it in most places along its length. You cannot look out and visually spot the other side. You need altitude to do that. <clears throat> and the valley, we look at this image here. This area here, this is 4,000 kilometers long, 2,500 miles. Basically, the area of the Mariner's Valley fault system is comparable to the continental United States. It's insanely big. I've driven across country. I know you have, Scott. Uh, many times. Many times. From here in... Northwest Arkansas to uh, Southern California when I made the journey uh, to move out here. That was a two-day trip, you know, 12 and a half hours of driving a day, basically 25 hours of driving, and I only got halfway across. So, and that's with a, with a superhighway system. This thing is, there's enough exploring to be done there for lifetimes. Uh, I can imagine, I can imagine there are Geologists right now, if I said, oh, did you hear Elon Musk is offering 
a one-way ticket to Mars and you get to explore the Mariner's Valley for the rest of your lifetime. And we'll land supply ships every couple of years, keep you supplied for as long as you last. I know there are many people who would say, give me the website. I want to sign up for my chance to win the geology trip of a lifetime. Uh, I have no doubt there are people who would be willing to go right now. Uh, but it would be more than a lifetime's exploration. And that's exciting to me. This says there's planetary science which will outlast me, which I find both melancholy and supremely exciting all at the same time. I want to be there to see somebody land and hop out and say, here we are in the Mariner's Valley. It's a great day to be on Mars. Uh, and I may or may not make that, but I know that will be done. So we look at this rift system. This valley covers more than 25% of the circumference of Mars. And here's this, this lovely image. And I, I think I can show you this. This is this lovely image. It shows you the map of the United States superimposed over the Mariner's Valley system. So we look at this and we go, wow, OK, uh, we've got this tremendous fault system, this tectonic fault system. Um, the closest thing I know of to this on Earth, it's no way comparable in terms of size or magnitude, but the San Andreas Fault. And I've driven out to the desert. And I've seen places where the San Andreas Fault has caused a, uh, a tectonic fault where one crust block has sunk. I've seen places where the San Andreas has torn apart roadway systems. And you can, you can walk right along it. And you look and you go, wow, the uh, Hector Mines earthquake back in, gosh, what about 2011, 2010, somewhere in there? Mm -hmm. uh, I was out in the desert, not too far from Hector Mines, uh, scary, but I went out afterwards to see the Hector Mines area. And you see some of the tectonic, uh, the damage that's done on the surface from a tectonic fault. <clears throat> and the Hector Mines faults, they were tens of meters wide and a few 10 meters deep maybe. Uh, and you realize, okay, this is a, 7.3 earthquake on the new Richter scale. And you go, holy cow. <laughs> if you look at that thing and Hector Mines, oh gosh, here, here's a fault that goes three or 400 meters, 10 meters deep and it's 20 meters wide. And you can see where, and you go, okay, wow, that's big, that's huge. And then you look at Mars and you go, nope, spit in the ocean, man. Uh, I can't imagine the amount of tectonic violence it took to pull the crust apart 125 kilometers the graben sinks seven kilometers deep the amount of energy release from that kind and this was not one event this was not a san andreas boom it shakes for a couple of minutes and we're done this had to be something that occurred over millennia possibly eons <clears throat> but the total amount of energy it takes, think about what it would take with earth moving equipment to dig a trench like that. Oh. <laughs> you take the energy output of the well, entire it, globe. It takes alien earth moving equipment, which, you know. Yeah. You could, you could take the entire energy output of the globe and it would still take centuries, uh, if not thousands of years to accomplish this sort of a thing. It's crazy. Uh, the amount of kinetic energy it takes <clears throat> to take that much earth and shift it is, is just, wow. My slide rule is broken now. It's too many zeros. <laughs> um, and indeed, we think the flowing water is a, is a problematic hypothesis because of the direction water flows there. And the other thing is, how long did Mars have when it could have had flowing water on the surface? We know the Grand Canyon took tens of millions of years for the Colorado River to cut this canyon, which is, uh, what, 100 kilometers long and a couple of kilometers wide and a couple of kilometers deep 
took millions of years. This would take billions of years for flowing water to carve this. And water wasn't yeah, Mars on the Martian hasn't surface. been around that long, right? Yeah, I mean, Mars got dry, years, but... dry and cold uh, relatively quickly. It did not have that long a period where water could have flown and made this kind of a structure. You take a look at the Gale Delta, the Gale Crater Delta, or one of the rovers is now, and you go, oh, this is a fascinating delta that formed over a couple million years. And you look at that and you go, okay, and Gale Crater is 125 kilometers wide and a couple kilometers deep, and that massive delta was carved, and you go, wow. And then you take a look at that compared to what you have in the Mariner's Valley, and it's just a teacup in the ocean. It's just, it's just uh, so tiny in comparison that it, it wouldn't account for even a tiny fraction of a fraction of a percent. And the, how much water would it take? How much water would it take to make that much uh, that's canyon That's a good carbon? question. That's a good Wait, question. I don't, I'm they, not they sure say, that much water exists that... on Mars or ever did. Mm -hmm. They say that uh, liquid water might have existed as recent as two to two and a half billion years ago. But right. if the right. if it solar existed, system is what, four and a half billion years, there still isn't a lot of time here to go no. from like a hot no. magma ball to no. having water on it, right? Exactly. So. Exactly. There was also a theory, I think, back in the early 80s, late 70s, where somebody was pumping the idea of liquid CO2. And this is, this is an artifact of the dry Mars era. We've talked about dry Mars, of course. Uh, theory from the 50s uh, through really the early 2000s. It was around for about half a century, which says Mars is moon-like in its dryness. There's no water there now, never was, never will be. Uh, and so when Viking sent back its photos of meandering river valleys and river deltas, there were people who seriously stood up, not just at NASA, but other organizations around the world and said, liquid carbon dioxide on a perfectly dry planet, you could have liquid CO2. No, 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 no. Uh, there's something called a triple point diagram. You familiar with this, Scott? No. It's a temperature pressure uh, diagram, and it says under what temperature and pressure conditions can you have a liquid? Obviously, if the temperature is too cold, you get it frozen into a solid. If the pressure is too low, it sublimates into a gas, and so uh, there's a range. Well, to get liquid CO2 at Earth atmospheric pressures at Earth atmospheric temperatures takes about four atmospheres of pressure. And the thing with CO2, if you get it too cold, it just freezes. So Mars would have had to have been relatively warm to have liquid CO2 and at least four atmospheres of pressure. Mars never had that much atmosphere. We find no evidence whatsoever that Mars had a atmosphere and you realize with the low gravity that takes more atmosphere to make that pressure so you would have had to have this super massive atmosphere on mars uh hundreds and hundreds of kilometers thick and there's no evidence that that ever happened on mars these were people who were saying no water no water what's another liquid that could make these features well there's plenty of co2 maybe liquid co2 they needed to consult a competent chemist and the chemist would have told them no, but uh, that was put out there. Flowing carbon dioxide, no. 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 The other theory that was put forward, maybe there was this huge underground pocket of magma that flowed out. It was like, okay, the hot water bottle has a leak. And so <laughs> you ever slept on an air mattress with a leak, Scott? Yes. Wake up in the morning, you're sleeping on the floor. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just like that. They said, well, 
there there must have been uh, a huge huge pocket of magma and again i think about the biggest subsurface magma deposits on earth and i thought ooh yellowstone super volcano mm -hmm. which is the biggest underground magma caldera type structure that we know of on earth and we think okay so this is uh 500 maybe a thousand kilometers wide and you think oh that's just a pimple compared to uh how much lava would this have taken my other question is okay if the water bottle sprung a leak where'd the liquid go to where did that much liquid magma go to and there's no evidence of some kind of a super volcanic outflow we have these kind of outflows on earth there's an area in india called the deccan traps d-e-c-c-a-n forgive me friends if i'm mispronouncing this the deccan traps this has for a long time thought to have been an artifact from the chicxulub meteor impact that killed the dinosaurs because the Deccan Traps is antipodal to the super crater in the Gulf of Mexico that's centered on Chicxulub and the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Well, they thought the shockwave traveled through and then there would have been an outbursting and the Deccan Traps, the lava flow there is four to five kilometers thick and it covers about 10,000 to 20,000 square kilometers. So it's a very large area and it's a huge volcanic outflow. Um, but that again, would have been a tiny fraction of a percent of what was necessary. So if it was some super outflow of magma, where's this gigantic lava plateau that if it the caldera or the valley is seven kilometers deep. You would expect at least a seven kilometer high lava plateau. We don't see that on the uh, Northern hemisphere. We do see the Tharsis bulge, but it's a volcanic uplift. It's not a lava plain. It's a different type of geologic structure. So none of these other theories that were brought up in the 70s and 60s after the first Mariner and then Viking probes went and photographed the surface of Mars with better and better accuracy. And there was this scramble by Earth scientists to explain how Mars evolved this way. And we were handicapped by our prejudices. Mm -hmm. People looked at the first photos of Mars from the Mariner missions, showed the Southern Highlands. They were absolutely barren. They were moon-like covered with craters. Uh, and then they said, ah, dry Mars, no water. The 70s, we had the Mariner. And Mariner remind everybody that, yes, there was two landers, but there were also two orbiters that stayed in orbit around Mars for years, taking uh, thousands of photographs. And they were photographing these features, which seemed to be water formed. Riverbeds, river deltas, uh, outflow channels from the gigantic floods, all sorts of what appeared to be water carved features, but the scientists looking at the photos, they had all been raised and trained with people who said, no water on Mars, Mars is dry. And so their training kind of kneecapped them in interpreting what they were seeing. Uh, it's not unusual, it happens. Uh, ask Galileo, who is showing his his telescope and showing moons around Jupiter and very high, very intelligent, learned people came up and looked in the eyepiece and said, I see it, but I don't believe it. And this cognitive dissonance, this, it doesn't match my training. My teachers all have said it can't be true. So I'm having trouble accepting this idea. Uh, this is a very common thing in science. New theories have trouble breaking through the old prejudices. <laughs> so we take a look at this lovely uh, photo, and I'm going to share a screen again. This is a more modern 
<coughs> image. This is a Themis. <coughs> and uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not coming up the all the clever people in the ESA and NASA and the DRL with their amazing acronyms. The Themis infrared camera image of the Mariner's Valley. So they're looking at this and you can see this lovely image and you can see, oh, there's, there's different lines of fracturing and there's a primary fracture that runs this way. And this is in far greater detail than we had from Viking. And this is an ESA image. So thanks to our friends from ESA for mm -hmm. sharing these with us in the public domain. And here is a NASA map <clears throat> that shows the labeled areas. And we see Tithonium Chasma, Ias Chasma, Mellis Chasma, Coprates Chasma, <clears throat> and Candor, uh, Ophir, Hebis, and all the chasm, of course, Scott is chasm or canyon or uh, tectonic rift valley. Chasm, chasm is really the best uh, modern. And this tithonium chasm, this little tiny side channel, this little, uh, this little sideshow to the great Mariner's Valley is what ESA has been focusing on most recently. And you're like, okay, but how much science can we really do when we talk about, yeah, okay, well, they're, they're in orbit, so what kind of, and again, prepare to be amazed because take a look at this photo. Now, this is a process, this is not a somebody sent an aircraft down into the atmosphere of Mars. This is a process photo. How did they do this? Well, the really clever people from ESA and the uh, German Space Agency, the DLR, they have stereo cameras. Did you ever play with a, uh, oh, uh, Viewmaster? Did you ever play with a Viewmaster when you were a kid, Scott? Sure, sure. The little, uh, it had the disc, right? And it yep. had stereo and you click the button and you're looking through cool. right eye, left eye. Remember those? Mm -hmm. you used to love those. And it was three dimensional. They've done the same thing here is they not only have a stereo camera, but they're able to take multiple images as the, air, the spacecraft flies over. And what they've done here is they've processed these images with their computers and the DLR has a specific lab where they do this uh, at the, one of their universities in Berlin. They process these images and they're able to use them to make an image which would correspond to what you would see if you were say in an airliner flying over the Martian surface. And so we see these marvelous steep canyon walls <clears throat> and we see the outflow regions here where there has been collapse and flow across the surface. It's just amazing. Here's another one. And this is again in Tithonium Chasma. And we look at this big hill and it's a very high, it's a very high mound or mountain. Uh, the, the Chasma at this point is about five kilometers deep and this this little mound that's lost in the chasma is about three kilometers high, give or take. And we can see that it's had erosion. And this was an uplift of uh, magma material. Why is it still there? It's harder rock. It's harder rock than the surrounding areas. The Monument Valley in the United States and the, uh, the Painted Desert and other places. You've been through there, Scott. I'm sure you have. Uh, in the desert, for sure. Yes. And you see these, it's, there's these lovely, steep, volcanic necks. And people go, what the heck is that? How did that form? Well, it's the throat of a volcano. And the basaltic lava inside the throat is a lot harder and more durable than the ash material that makes the cone. And so over millions of years, the cone gets eroded away. And we have this volcanic neck, uh, the most famous one in the world 
is the Devil's Tower, which was made famous in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. If you haven't put that, seen that, folks, put it on your Netflix. Take a look, Steven Spielberg, great movie. But it shows this volcanic neck. And here we have something similar. This is a volcanic feature that's just much harder rock than the surrounding areas in the chasma. And so the surrounding material gets eroded away and this beautiful feature comes out and reveals itself. And so we know the history of the Mariner's Valley is very complex. Erosion, both water and wind have had a role in shaping this valley. Uh, wind erosion continues to play a strong role today and it forms dunes. Uh, and er air erosion, wind erosion features on the floor. And we see these different kinds of dunes and people are studying them today. Some new stuff, I didn't have time to put it in, but there's uh, some new features <clears throat> about, uh, they're using false color images to show how the wind flows in particle size. Mm. They're taking pictures here, Scott. The resolution is nine centimeters per pixel. Wow. Between the, the various areas between nine and 25 centimeters a pixel. So <clears throat> if we took my book and we tossed it on the ground, they'd be able to image that. Yeah. A dinner plate, a textbook. And a, this is so amazing. Uh, <clears throat> and sometimes people say, nah. Well, there are images uh, of there's an image of one of the rovers and you can see the tracks and you can see the rover and one of the mast cams is sticking up and you can see the mast shadow, which you know is quite slim. And you, they, can, they can take a picture of that. You can see water erosion, mostly occurring along the canyon rims. Forgive me, I'm using canyon. Along the rims of the, of the chasm. Uh, and you can see that water erosion has caused some of those areas to collapse and outflow. Uh, the other thing we're seeing is sulfate minerals that are detectable from space. And yes, with infrared signatures, we can detect sulfate and carbonate minerals. And uh, we see dune material in tithonium in IS chasma as well, that's chemically traceable to the Tharsis volcanoes. The Ascaris Mons, Pavonis Mons, Olympus. I'm blanking on the fourth one, sorry. <laughs> but uh, you can see this image, and this again is an ESA DLR image. <clears throat> and it shows uh, Is Chasma and Tithonium chas Chasma. And they're using the high resolution stereo camera. And 25. <clears throat> This image in particular is about 25 meters per pixel. And you can, there's a link there in the show notes. You can download the full image. The full image is huge. It's tens of megabytes. And you could put this thing on your computer in full, full scale and you won't be able to see the whole thing. You can zoom in <clears throat> and you could just zoom in and in and in and you're seeing more and more and more detail. It looks like a CGI, but it's not. It's just amazing camera technology that we have on Mars. <coughs> and so if you go look up the Themis camera images from ESA, or you go look up High Rise, which is a high resolution uh, camera from NASA, and you take a look at these, you can get some of these images I just, I love, Scott, I just love it. I pull up one of these images. Mm -hmm. I'll just spend an hour just at my computer screen. And why just not? I mean, jaw you know, hanging open and we're the, we're the humans that are alive. They can see this I stuff. Just, ooh, you know? I could camp there and then I could climb here. Right. I just like, wow, stunning. Right. I think about the times I've flown over the Western United States and looking down at the Rocky Mountains and, and the great Western desert. And I'm like, oh man. Yeah, you can only imagine the amount of time that Percival Lowell would have poured over looking at these. Oh images. my gosh. Like the rest yeah. of his life, you know? So Yeah, he would have he would have uh, given a significant uh, well let's let's say a Shakespearean pound of flesh 
for yes. just one of those images that he could pour over. Yes. And the technology. Uh, and we have I had, today. I, it's amazing. Yeah, it would have to be printed really, really large uh, to even get close to seeing all the possible detail. I know you have a super printer there at the Explore no, Studio. No, not big enough. No, it's not. And it's only prints 65 inches wide. Okay, yeah, I was so. going to say, you only print about five feet wide or, right. uh, yeah, 65 inches. So what is that? It's uh, five going foot, on. Five foot five, yeah. Yeah, 1.7 meters, something like that. <clears throat> Crazy big, but it couldn't show the whole. Well, I guess we can make a mosaic and yeah. you know cover up the. That would, that would be a really expensive uh, wallpaper for your studio. Yes. but I encourage you. In, <laughs> <laughs> I encourage you in this adventure. So there we go. So have we got some good questions this week? Well, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. I always joke with my students, this is an exhibition of teacher awesomeness. When you stun them into silence and questionless. And they are stunned into silence. Yes, I have, yes. I have taught you so, into the ground and you have tapped out without any questions. <laughs> Bam. That's right. My fall. Well, we gave, I, I was, following along reasonably well enough to also search the web and post some links, okay, in Good. chat. So, um, but uh, yeah, we, I'll go over, uh, uh, we had space time with Robert watching, Mike Wiesner was on, um, Paul Burgart was uh, tuned in, Mark Beatrice Hines was there. Uh, um, Always glad Pekka, to see her. Pekka helped a lot. He, he did ask questions, of course. Okay. Uh, but he is, uh, his questions had to do with double stars. So okay. that's where his mind was in space Send those today. to me, Pekka. You have my address, astronomy for educators at <laughs> right. gmail.com. Right. And we'll tackle them. Yeah. I, will, I will tell you, Scott, next week, we're going to kind of, uh, as Monty Python used to say, and now for something completely different. Hmm. What happens when science goes wrong? Uh oh. We've we've talked often enough about Karl Popper's idea: science is a cage match, last man standing. The theory in the textbook is the one no one could destroy. Well, what happens when someone comes up with an idea, and it's too good to let go of? Hmm. Have you heard about the uh, the monkey trap? You take a trap. coconut yeah. and you <clears throat> drill a small hole in it and you fill it with milk and sweet rice and then yeah. you attach it to a chain and chain it to a tree and a monkey will come along and smell some of the sweet rice and there's more inside. They will reach inside to grab a handful. The yeah. hole is small enough for their hand, but too small. Oh, and then they fist, can't get it out and they can't their fist get is... their they're so so let go. to the prize they can't let go and they get captured. Well, next week we'll have a story about someone whose theory about science mm. was so delicious, so delightful, and they put their hand in the coconut and they realized quite early on that it wasn't true. Uh -oh. But the rewards they were getting for the theory were so awesome, they couldn't let go. They couldn't stop and say, well, as a scientist of integrity, I have to say my new research has said I was wrong about this. So cross this one off your list, kids. This one doesn't work. <clears throat> and I have, I have extensive experience in the negative result sort of science. Uh, I spent a year working for the United States government uh, on a on a theory, and I'll tell more about that last week. And we sat down and we came up with 15 different theories. It was about toxic mold that grows on grain. And how can we stop the toxin so the grain isn't spoiled? Billions of dollars at stake, right? All this. Well, we spent a year at a high powered government lab uh, with all the equipment and resources I could handle. And we came up with 15 hypotheses in over a year. 
we crossed off every single one as negative. And this was my thesis project for a science degree. And I had to go back to my, <clears throat> my college and I had to say, you know, okay, we're gonna have you present your results from your thesis. And I said, here's this one and it doesn't work. And here's this next one, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work and no, this is wrong and this is wrong. And I spent two and a half hours telling everybody what didn't work. And somebody of course raised their hand and said, but what's the answer? I said, I don't know yet. Ran out of time, I ran out of money and we're not sure. We have these other ideas that we weren't able to test. But right now, all I can tell you is don't try this stuff because it doesn't work. I got my degree. I was, I was terrified I was not going to get my degree. So to some extent, I understand these folks sure. who we're going to talk about next week, okay. why they were reluctant. And people might say, well, that's terrible, villains. And can't tell you how many billions of dollars were spent on these wrong ideas. But science is ultimately self-correcting, unlike almost any other human endeavor, economic, political, you know, art, culture, science really is self-correcting. So Eventually. next week, we're going to talk about what happens when science goes wrong, and then how do we get back on track? Because the wonderful thing about science history is that we've always gotten back on track. Sometimes it takes us centuries, but... <laughs> Bad answers eventually under the onslaught of fresh new ideas, new research, and new technology. And that's going to be our kind of scary science horror story for next week's show. <laughs> Daniel, thank you so much for uh, presenting uh, yet another How Do You Know? Um, we will, um, we have more program coming this week, except that we will not have a Global Star Party this Tuesday. Um, several of us that do Global Star Parties, including myself, just got back from a uh, uh, being out last weekend, uh, pouring in a lot of energy into that and did not have time to plan another Global Star Party uh, to appear tomorrow. So uh, our next Global Star Party will be August 9th, Tuesday. It'll be the 101st event, and uh, we hope you tune in for that. So, um, and if you didn't have a chance to watch all the uh, videos that we shot at the Astronomical League conference, you might want to take a look. Yes. Uh, we had uh, uh, Dr. Seth Shostak, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, with his entire keynote uh, talk. Uh, we had a short <coughs> interview with uh, Apollo 17's Harrison Schmidt. We had... Um, uh, uh, presentation awards that were covered, uh, including the National Young Astronomers Award, the w Wilhelmina Fleming um, Women in Astrophotography Award, and the Leslie Peltier Award, where a good friend of mine uh, was really proud to see this. Uh, uh, Barbara Harris was um, uh, nominated and selected for that lifetime achievement in astronomy, so that was really cool. Um, so just watching the, the various video, videos that we had, we also had like uh, uh, Mike Zeiler and Mike Bakich who have written some great books on, uh, on the upcoming eclipses. Um, uh, these guys know more about the eclipses than anybody, I think. Um, and so uh, just, gosh, it was just a ton of information. I tried, it was like a flood just trying to capture all the you know, fire hose of information that came out of this thing um, and uh, did my best to present much of it, uh, but certainly not all of it because there was so much more. Uh, I watched I watched a lot of those uh, presentations on Facebook when they were posted right. live. Well worth yeah, your so, time, folks, to go. So they're on the Explore Scientific um, yeah. official channel on YouTube. Uh, on Explore Scientific's Facebook page, on the Astronomical League's Facebook page. So you'll you'll see them all there. We also had some outside contributors. So it was a really kind of uh, me uh, really getting a full uh, taste of what it's like to do a hybrid event, you know. So um, hope you enjoy them. And uh, uh, anyways, um, until tomorrow, uh, 
we will bid you adieu and we will wish you, uh, you know, uh, clear skies wherever you are and wish that you keep looking up. So thanks very much. Thanks, Thank Daniel. You, everybody. Take care, man.